What about strength? Yes. Strength. King Robert was strong. He won the rebellion and crushed the Targaryen dynasty. And he attended three small council meetings in 17 years. And he spent his time pouring and hunting and drinking until the last two killed him. I love Robert Baratheon. And I mean, who doesn't? The guy has an amazing backstory leading up to the events of Game of Thrones. He has such a magnetic personality that you can't help but like him. Thank the gods for Bessie and her tits. But let's be real, Robert as a king was awful. And a lot of people forget about how bad he was because of the kings that ruled Westeros after his death. Welcome back to Shade Cinema. My name is Chris and I'm here to discuss Robert's reign as king of Westeros as well as to point out why Bobby B is not as great of a king as everyone remembers him to be, or would like to remember him being. But in order to properly dissect Robert's reign, we must go back in time to how Robert ascended to the Iron Throne to begin with. Robert was a massive yet well-respected warrior in his youth, a light-hearted man in top physical shape who wielded a warhammer so heavy that only he could use it effectively. Despite having the brutish nature that he did, his foster father, John Aaron, taught the young man about Westerosi politics and history alongside his friend slash foster brother, Ned Stark. Robert was betrothed to Ned's sister, Lyanna Stark, from a young age and looked forward to marrying her one day. But Lyanna knew his true nature. She knew how much Robert loved indulging himself in the company of women and feared that he wouldn't be faithful to her. So Lyanna's eyes wandered elsewhere until they locked eyes with a silver-haired man, that man being the crown prince and heir to the Iron Throne, Rhaegar Targaryen. At the end of the tournament in Harrenhal, Rhaegar defeated the legendary warrior Barris and Selmy in a joust and was given the blue crown of roses to give to a woman in the crowd and declare her the queen of love and beauty. Rhaegar surprised everyone when he rode past his wife Elia Martell of Dorne and gave the crown to Lyanna Stark. The crowd was aghast and the typically light-hearted Robert became filled with rage. This moment changed Robert and his fate forever, as now his position to marry his love has been threatened by another man. Ned Stark called it the moment when all smiles die. Rhaegar then supposedly kidnaps Lyanna and disappears, which pisses the Starks off. So Brandon Stark, Ned's brother, and Rickard Stark, Ned's father, ride to King's Landing to confront Rhaegar. King Aerys II, better known as the Mad King, saw this as a threat against Rhaegar's life, arrested them, and later executed the two Starks and their men. Aerys then demanded Jon Arryn to deliver both Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon to King's Landing for execution. Jon Arryn defied the Mad King's orders and started a rebellion against the Crown. Robert would of course play a major part in this rebellion, participating in many battles, notably the Battle of Goldstown, the first major rebellion victory in the war, the Battle of the Bells, where it is said that Robert joined the battle as he was leaving a brothel, as one does, and most importantly, the battle at the Trident, where Robert's army clashed against Rhaegar's forces at the banks of the river. Robert met Rhaegar on the field of battle and killed the last dragon with his warhammer. After the sacking of King's Landing by Tywin Lannister's forces, the death of King Aerys II, and subsequent coronation of Robert as King of the Seven Kingdoms, Ned Stark traveled to the Tower of Joy in Dorne and found his kidnapped sister dying with her son Aegon in her hands, who was then adopted by Ned as his bastard John to protect him from Robert's wrath. The truth is that Rhaegar never kidnapped Lyanna, but the duo had fallen in love and had gotten secretly married. Lyanna's death heavily affected Robert. He took his frustrations out by condoning the deaths of Rhaegar's former wife Elia Martell and their children which is ironic because his house is linked to the Targaryens, the Baratheons being distant relatives, helped legitimize Robert's claim to the throne. Robert is then crowned king, and as King Robert I of House Baratheon, he is tasked with the rebuilding of the Seven Kingdoms into a bustling realm of prosperity. Many people saw this as a great opportunity for change. It unfortunately did not live up to expectations. Robert's reign was peaceful, but pretty uneventful. One big problem was that he had serious trouble with controlling his spending. By the end of his tenure, the crown owed about 6 million golden dragons to the Iron Bank of Dravos, the Lannisters and the Tyrells. This debt created a great power imbalance over the crown, as now the Lannisters brought their own people and allies into the royal court to influence the crowd's decision making. The debt is a result of Robert's general dislike and apathy 
towards ruling Westeros. He spent a lot of time hunting, drinking, partying, and slaying 304s, which drained the royal coffers heavily, while the actual governing of his kingdoms was left to his trusted hand, John Eric. The small council basically caved to Robert's indulgent whims. And yeah, you can argue Littlefinger was trying to climb up the ladder in the royal court and was purposely trying to undermine Robert's authority because chaos is a ladder. But Robert is still the king. He can appoint and dismiss anyone he wants to, but he didn't because he cared very little about his job. It's funny because Robert once commented on a what if scenario involving the Dothraki invading Westeros and how the people of Westeros wouldn't unite behind an absentee king hiding in his castle. Yet he himself is already an absentee king. He's gone to only three small council meetings during his rule and had barely made an impact upon the lives of his people. At certain points, it's like as if he's a trust fund baby living off the wealth of his parents, except that the money comes from the state, i.e. the people, and he himself is the parent that has no cap placed upon the money that he can spend. Ten years into his reign, however, the Greyjoys rebel and begin raiding the Lannister coastline. Robert, after years of being bored of being the king and being in severe debt to the Lannisters, jumped at the first opportunity to start fighting another war. Fueled by the nostalgia of his rebellious past, he marched towards the Iron Islands with his army and besieged the capital, Pike, in less than a year. He did show mercy towards Balon Greyjoy and allowed him to continue ruling the Iron Islands after his defeat, which shows that the Robert of old is not fully gone at this point. The successful campaign not only bolstered Robert's legitimacy, but also demonstrated that he was still capable in combat and displayed his strategic prowess. Although that was a nice little adventure that brought a little bit of the fire back for Robert, it would not last for long. Robert soon after fell back into the old habits that he had before the rebellion, as he continued to struggle to bring together a personal life that was worth living. After taking the throne, Robert initially did not want to get married. He still mourned the death of his beloved Lyanna, but John Arryn pushed him to get married to Cersei Lannister for political and strategic reasons. The Lannisters had a lot of gold and a large army, so it made them a very viable choice for a political marriage. They could also help in repelling a counter-revolution had the Targaryen children ever landed back in Westeros with an army behind them. Robert begrudgingly agreed to this, and he and Cersei got married. Although Cersei liked Robert initially, the marriage very quickly became a loveless affair. With Robert still mourning Lyanna's death, and Cersei resenting Robert due to his incessant cheating and her affections towards her husband being unreturned. Cersei would eventually do her best to undermine Robert's authority, which gave her and the Lannisters more and more control over Westeros. They both hated each other and they were both unfaithful during their marriage, with Robert fathering 16 to 20 bastards and his three supposedly legitimate heirs that he had with Cersei turned out to be bastards as well that were the result of an incestuous relationship between Cersei and her twin brother Jaime. Robert was never particularly close with his children. He specifically viewed Joffrey as a wimp, especially after Joffrey was beaten up by Arya, and he didn't seem to care much about the other two, Marcella and Tommen. He was out on his hunts when Cersei was giving birth to the kids, which displayed his lack of care. It however seems as though deep down Robert does care for his children, but he doesn't show it much due to his semi-depressed state. He's constantly seeking gratification via alcohol, partying, and fooling around. He does this because he is still trying to drown his sadness with pleasure, but sadness cannot be cured with pleasurable acts. Sadness is cured with accepting the bad things that have happened, and most importantly, moving on. If you equate this to an injury, pleasure is like a painkiller, while acceptance is like surgery. The pleasures that Robert is seeking and getting only mask his sadness for maybe a day at a time but he's still depressed the next day. Coming to terms with Lyanna's death and finding happiness again will take time, but it will make a lasting positive difference in his life. Now, I'm not saying that someone being sad makes them a terrible king, but a good king would learn to bounce back from his losses and regroup physically, mentally, and spiritually. Robert failed to do so, which cost him greatly at the end. While on a hunt, Robert's wine was made to be super strong, which got him so drunk that he ended up getting hit by a boar his wounds would eventually be fatal. On his deathbed, Robert regrets living the life that he did and asks Ned to teach and mentor Joffrey until he becomes of age to rule. Not knowing that Joffrey is a bastard and not knowing that Ned knows about him. Although not super apparent, his failures are about to become more and more evident as his successor takes the throne. 
So Robert is now dead and Joffrey is crowned as king. Ned Stark, being an honorable man and knowing of Joffrey's true lineage, objects the coronation of the young king. Stark is then promptly arrested and as he was about to be sent to the Wall to become a member of the Night's Watch, Joffrey orders Ned to be executed, which surprises everyone. This of course starts a war with the North, with Ned's oldest son Rob Stark declaring himself the King in the North. Robert's brothers, Stannis, who knows about Joffrey's incestuous origins, and Renly, who allied himself with the Tyrells, stake their claims to the Iron Throne and declare themselves as kings respectively. And they begin their rebellions against the Crown. Balon Greyjoy, who launched a rebellion during Robert's reign, also took the opportunity to rebel against the Crown and declare independence for the Iron Islands. So by the start of the war, you have a map that looks like this. So if you're wondering what this has to do with Robert Baratheon, here is the answer. The War of the Five Kings would not have happened had Robert done his job and procured himself a legitimate heir. Most of the war was based on a succession crisis, but not just that, it was also caused by an impulsive young king. Joffrey's reign, although brief, was rife with tyranny. The young king was a sadist and he loved to torment his subjects. I believe that he enjoyed hurting others so much because his father was the king and Joffrey knew that he was next in line. Robert had not shown him what it means to have real power. Robert failed to make Joffrey into someone that was fit to be king because, frankly, Robert himself was not fit to be king either. Of course, Robert is not solely responsible for the actions of his son, but you can't deny that the lack of Robert's presence and lack of proper tutelage hindered Joffrey's development. Robert's excessive spending left the crown in severe debt to the Lannisters, and eventually the Tyrells. How much, how much debt do you owe to the Lannisters? Three gazillion dollars. <laughs> when he should have been using the long summer to his advantage to stock up on food and gold in order to last through the winter years. But then again, Robert had no interest in establishing a golden age of prosperity. Because of that, and also due to the several wars that happened after his death, the Seven Kingdoms will have a very difficult time during the coming winter years. Also due to the fact that he is the first non-Targaryen king to rule Westeros, his rule, although acknowledged as legitimate and rightful, was a hotbed for political scheming and backstabbing, especially against the crown. Targaryen rule was, in general, well respected amongst the noble houses and the people as a whole. Meanwhile, Robert's rule wasn't as well respected, partly due to the amount of time he had been king, but also because Robert was seen by some as a usurper at best and a drunken fool at worst. And although there was some dissent and politicking during the Targaryen era, it was to a much less significant degree to where the position of the Targaryens on the Iron Throne was never directly threatened, as no man can overcome the power of a dragon, but a stag can be definitely killed by a man. So ultimately, Robert's reign and eventual death led to a tyrannical king who started a war against the whole of Westeros, which ended in the deaths of both of his brothers, the near annihilation of his foster brother's whole family, the death of thousands upon thousands of civilians, and a severe draining of the realm's resources that might cause the realm to starve in the next winter. This is the legacy of Robert Baratheon. Robert's reign as king is a stark reminder that no matter how popular someone in politics is or how beloved they are, they often can be unqualified to do the job that they are assigned to do. Robert was extremely popular with the people after the fall of the Targaryens, but he fumbled the ball so egregiously that he had lost much of the respect and prestige he had gained by the time of his death. Running a whole kingdom is difficult work, and Robert didn't try to be king. But I think the deeper lesson here is something different that was hinted throughout the video, which is, a king is only as good as his legacy, as what he leaves behind. That statement doesn't just apply to kings, but to everyone. The legacy you have is the mark on the world that you leave behind after you die. And whether it's positive or negative, it is the thing you will be remembered for. It doesn't matter how good you are at something, if you leave no trace of it, it won't be remembered. An amazing carpenter who doesn't build anything is not remembered as a carpenter. But why should we be remembered? Why should you strive to leave a legacy behind? Because it's through remembrance that you're able to positively impact the lives of others. The things you build, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, is your legacy. And in the game of life, you have two choices. Build a legacy that will last for many generations, or wither way into the void, forgotten. If you want my advice, it's pretty simple. Be consequential. Thank you guys so much for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe for more video essays. If you have any comments and thoughts about the video, Robert Baratheon, or Game of Thrones as a whole, agreed with me or disagreed with me, please leave them down in the comment section below. Also, if you have any suggestions for future video essays, comment them down below. I read and reply to every comment and I am willing to engage in a conversation with you guys. Special shout out to my friend Panos for helping me out with the research for this video. If you would like to see what makes a good king, click the link on the left side of the screen.